up. Like last night, we were playing Madagascar on the big screen and eating pizza, just having a great time. Pastor Gene's chasing, you know, little ones around. It, I, I enjoyed watching that. And <laughs> but really, the big thing was um, some of the feedback we got. So I wanted to share this comment with you from somebody, because I just think this is a, a big win, two, two big ones. Uh, one, a lady, I overheard her talking with Chrissy, and she said that this this was hard for them to like kind of let their kids go for a little bit to have somebody else watch them. And they were willing to do that. And she said this was the first date her husband and her had had in a year just because life got busy. And they came back and said how good it was for them. And I wanted to share this comment with you too. I thought this was pretty neat. It was from Facebook um, about this parents night out. It says, this is just fantastic and probably the neatest thing I've ever seen a church do. And I wanted to share that with you, not like, hey, check us out. It's really God showed up and... Uh, this was just a way that he put it on some folks here at the church on their heart just to bless you, the church. And so I'm just super thankful. Thanks for those that served, helped make it happen. Really big deal. Um, so a few things I just wanted to share on announcements is we've got a lot of stuff going on. Take a look at it. Um, if you go on our website, rlmsv.com slash events, we've got everything listed on there coming up. Um, on our website, too, we have all the different ministries you know, on here it's listed grief share ministry, car care ministry. You can take a look at those. We have many others. Uh, we have small groups that meet pretty much every day of the week, men specific, women specific, and then home groups. Lots of stuff going on. Uh, one that's kind of on my heart is the men's hub. So every Saturday we've got this building open at 6 a.m. Classes start at 6.30. And this was uh, something that Gene mentioned Friday night that I'm like, this is God again showing up and leading us is on the 26th, there's going to be a new six-week study, A Man and His Marriage. Interesting timing as we're talking about God's design for marriage. And so this is an opportunity for you guys to, to just meet some other guys on their walk with Jesus as we stumble towards the cross, as, as Clint Kunze puts it. And uh, you can just be encouraged, be discipled, I would highly encourage you to check that out if you're a guy. And yes. Perfect. Okay. There you go. There's one of our leaders there letting us know. Thanks, Brian. Awesome, awesome. And then I just want to mention two other things, and then we'll pray here. Uh, here at the church on Sunday, March 13th, uh, we're going to do a chili cook-off, which also in includes cornbread. Where's Ray? Where's Ray at? Former champion right here. Defending <laughs> champion, if I remember right. <laughs> People's champion, there you go. That's right. <laughs> so I was asked to be one again, and yes, I can handle the heat. So. <laughs> I know we had, we had one on one of the judges where literally like I saw steam shoot him out of his ears. I'm like, it's all right, bro. So it is, it's going to be a really fun night. Uh, Cornerstone is going to show up with us. Hopefully they don't cheat this year, right, Gene? Yeah, that's right. It's true. <laughs> if you can't tell, we like to have fun with this thing. <laughs> and uh, it's going to be a really good time. Uh, please show up. Even if you just show up just to eat and hang out, please do. Uh, but you can go online to rlmsv.com events, and you can actually register if you want to have your chili judged. And get your little uh, chili guy trophy, and it'll be a good time. And then one last thing, summer's coming. Yeah! So the RLM SB softball signups are coming up soon. So if you're interested in the softball teams, I think last year we had two. Uh, those will be coming up. For me, I just it reminds me that, yes, summer is true. It actually does come back, and yeah, no, it's all good. All right. Well, I'm just glad everyone's here. If you're new with us, super glad you showed up this morning. Welcome. Uh, we're really glad that you're here, and I just hope the service is a blessing to everybody. But this is a full room. Love it. Love it. Love it. So let me pray for the service. Uh, Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning, God. Thank you for each person that is here. Um, they could be many places this morning, Lord, but you drew them in to this church family, and uh, they're here this morning, God. And I just pray as we continue to worship here shortly, um, that you would just have our hearts open to worship, God, that we can 
push those distractions out of our mind that, you know, we come into church with, Lord, there's many times where I find myself distracted, and I just need to take that moment, that deep breath, focus on you, God, and uh, just thank you just for your love for me. Lord, I just pray everyone this morning knows how much they are loved by you, a holy, perfect God. God, no matter where they're at in their, their walk with you, those that are maybe questioning if you're trustworthy, God, I pray that they know that you are. And those this morning, God, that are struggling maybe with a sick loved one or, or their own uh, sickness, Lord, that you would just strengthen them, encourage them. Um, thank you, Lord, for those that are just abiding in you. And I pray, God, that they would just be a blessing and an encouragement to others. God, thank you for those that are watching online. I thank you for um, technology and how you redeem it. And I'm reminded that is one of the ways that we can share your word uh, online globally, Lord. And I just pray for your church this morning. I lift up Gene and Christy. I pray that their time up here on the stage, you would just speak a mighty word through them. God, you would use their testimony on the awesome change, uh, the power that you've uh, done it in their, in their life and in their marriage, God. And so thank you for them. And most of all, God, I, I just pray that we, as your people, would have open hearts to your word, God. Um, some of us come in with hard hearts this morning, and I pray, Lord, that you would soften those hearts so we can hear from your word. Uh, pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, we're going to stand up real quick, say hi to each other, and then we'll continue worship in a minute.
See you later, kids ministry. Love you guys. Good morning, church. Please be seated. If you're new with us today, I'm Gene. I get to serve here as a lead pastor, and this is my wife, Christy. Good and morning. Oh, yeah, it's on. Good morning. Okay, it's going to be one of those days already. It almost became one of those days. So, um, we, we, are, we are taking some time this morning and talking about uh, God's design for marriage. So, we're talking about that this morning together. And before we do that, though, we're going to do what we like to do every week and prepare our hearts to hear from the Lord. We're going to be talking about some issues, I think, today that are potentially um, challenging. Um, I think that's a good word for it. And... So we, we, as we prayed earlier with the team, is that we're praying that our hearts will be open to hear from God. Some of the things we're going to talk about, maybe you haven't practiced it well in your marriage or seen it practiced well, and it doesn't mean that it's not God's best design just because we don't do it well. But we're going to ask that God will um, empower us by his Holy Spirit to be the people that he says that we are. So let's take a moment. We invite you to every week, we take a moment as a church family, and we like to pray through three items. Uh, first of all, I invite you to pray for yourself, to, to ask Jesus this morning to forgive you of any sins that separate you from the intimacy that you can enjoy with him, to um, maybe as we look at this subject of marriage, maybe you're in a season right now where your marriage is hard. So to ask God to uh, empower you to be the, the one who lives out the gospel in your marriage. Maybe there's a, the second item I'd like to invite you to pray for is other people. Pray for those people. We, we love to do this every week. Pray for those people that don't know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. I like to picture their, their face as I pray for them in my sanctified imagination. Ask God to share the good news of the gospel with them, but ask God to give me the courage to tell them the good news about Jesus. Pray for those you know who are struggling this morning. Maybe ask God how you could help in that struggle. And lastly, we pray for Jesus' church. We pray for this church that will stay committed to the mission of Christ, that Jesus has called us to of making disciples of Jesus who can make disciples of Jesus. We like to pray for the other churches in the Silver Valley. Pray for them by name. Pray for their pastors and their congregation that they'll stay united. And then pray for the church globally. And, and lately it's been on my heart is, is Russia and Ukraine. Um, it looks like there's going to be conflict in that part of the world that, that we know there's a church on the ground there that is, um, man, they've, they, they have the good news of reconciliation and redemption that they've been given through the cross. So we like to pray for that church on the ground in, in Russia and Ukraine. So we'll just take a moment and, and pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to come into your throne room to receive mercy and grace in our time of need. And Lord, help us to be honest about um, our neediness. That Lord, we need you. Lord, we need your, your life-saving spirit. We need your forgiveness. We need your love. We need your encouragement. We need your strength. God, I'm grateful that you're a good, good father that that gives everything in abundance because you have everything. You're, you're, you're more powerful than anything that we face in our, in our lives. You've already defeated the challenges. You've defeated the enemy. You've defeated sin and death at the cross and at the empty tomb. Lord God, you invite us into a life with you that is abundant with love and abundant with peace. As we just sang, all of the challenges going on in the world right now, 
we can proclaim loudly, honestly, with all integrity that, that our hearts are full of peace because we know Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, as we uh, talk about marriage today and you're designed for it, we pray, God, that we would listen intently, that we would listen to where you're trying to speak to each one of us. Whether we're married or single, regardless of where we are in our life, I just believe that we can learn from your word, that you have a word for us, God. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would empower us to be who you say we are. We love you, Lord. Thanks for um, Christy and I getting to, to, to do this together. I pray you'd be glorified this morning. We love you and pray this in your name. Amen. So, uh, so those of you that were here last week, we talked about God's design for marriage, kind of gave you the overall design. And uh, as we shared with you last week, you know, we've been married 30 years, um, and we're still kind of working this stuff out ourselves, uh, and we'll probably continue to be, right? Um, because marriage isn't easy. Anyone attest to that this morning? Okay. <laughs> Marriage is hard, but it's not too hard, right? Because as followers of Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit in us. And so as followers of Jesus with the Holy Spirit in us, we can be who God says that we are because he does that heavy lifting in our, our lives. So last week, we gave you some homework to do. And the homework was that wives were to write their husbands a letter telling their husbands their needs, okay? And then the, the, the goal is, husbands that you will spend some time in the next months, years, rest of the days you're breathing on the planet, meeting the needs of your wife, right? The real needs. Now, I got to ask this question. How many of you are working on that homework? Okay, better than Friday night. There were like two people Friday night, and I was like, oh, you got to be kidding me. Because <laughs> here's the thing about marriage, right? It, it, it only, um, God's design and God's plan only works if you work it right? Um, and, and so um, I got the letter Thursday night. Thursday night, I got the letter, right? She... Okay, I have to, I'm going to share. <laughs> so I, I, I shared last week that I, this was a big thing for me is to realize that I actually do have needs and needs that he's supposed to help meet. So, so I did it. I did my homework and I told him that morning, hey, I have the letter for you. And his, he looked at me. <laughs> I could just see the panic on his face. God bless him. And I was like, Panic may be a strong word. <laughs> um, yeah, fear, trepidation, I don't know. But So I just kind of joked, you know, head or gut, where do you want it? <laughs> That's a joke that we have in our house. So, so I'm really, really proud of him because he is kind of a guy that just... <laughs> slowly rolls into the morning and then sometimes when he comes home from work he just kind of slowly rolls into the house and you know it's that shift and so he got home that night and he's like all right where's the letter <laughs> like, bring it on sister <laughs> so yeah super proud of him super well it was it was i was just super so i'm gonna knock on her since that's the kind of day we're having is uh, I got home and, and, and I read the letter and it was way, it was awesome. I, I was super glad. Because, because I told you last week, she told me that the next 30 years, I hope they're better, right? And, and I'm like, me, me too. Um, so, <laughs> so once she gave me the letter, I'm like, okay, here's some stuff we can intentionally work on. And, and so it was super good because, guys, we want to love our wives, right? I mean, let's be honest. We want to do that, but we don't always know how, right? Right. Um, and so, uh, so I was glad that she gave it to me. But here's where I'm going to knock her off. Is she was honest with me and said, I actually had to Google, what are women's needs? I did. I am not joking. Seriously. I, okay, next week we're talking about marriage and the three-letter word. And I kind of have an idea on those needs, but then even not sure yeah. because there's a lot of things that lead up to that. And that's kind of where I got stuck. And so I literally did, got on my friend Google and said, what are women's needs? And it gave me some list of things to start with, which I was really grateful for, because then I could ask for myself, okay, is that something that I need? Is that something that I can do myself? Is that something Jean could meet? So it was really good. So, yeah. And it, it's going to be a process. We're going to we're going to continue to unpack Yeah, I, I read the letter like four times and then, and then asked her clarifying questions. Which I knew uh, he would. Yeah. 
And then I took pictures of it. And I've got it on my phone. I've, I've got the letter in my wallet. You know, I'm thinking about a tattoo on the arm. Ooh, um, there we go. So, so, so here, guys, I just want to talk to you about this because, because your wife may be in the same spot Christy was, that she's not sure. Yeah, and actually, hold on. Um, so this is what I love. I know. <laughs> you know I'm the preacher, right? Okay. Let me just, here. here. All right. Get, no, I'm just kidding. So, um, so here's the thing that I love. I love, love, love about our church, and this is what I love about Jesus and the Holy Spirit, is that last week I think we ripped off some bandages. I think we started a conversation in some homes that needed to happen. And I don't know how many women I heard from, but a lot this week that said, because we talked about being an intimacy killer or avoider. That's how the conversation started last week. And I got a lot of messages from women who said, hey, I think I'm that 15%, that intimacy avoider or killer. So I know that there are women out there that struggle with it. But guys, here's what I want to say to you. If your wife hasn't done this yet or isn't doing it, okay, I want you to lovingly encourage her to do it. Okay, because I've talked to some of the guys, and they're like, I don't want the list. (laughs) Right, because once the bar gets raised, what if I don't meet the bar, okay? But I got to tell you, as you're going to learn today, guys, there's a responsibility on you to lead in your marriage. So don't do it. Don't control your wife. Don't, don't beat her into, or browbeat her into writing the letter, but encourage her because you're the leader in your marriage. And, and I think we're just held at a, at a level of responsibility before God for the, 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 the environment we create in our marriage as men. So, thank you. It's environment because here's the other part of this. My husband is safe to me now. He wasn't a long time ago. But now he's safe to me, and now I feel like I can actually come to him with some of these needs. So, thank you. You're welcome. Should we get after it? Yeah, let's do this. Okay. So every week we've had a video that uh, some folks in our church have put together, kind of sharing their story for where they are in regard to uh, the topic we're talking about. And today we're talking about men's and women's roles in marriage. So we had John and Charity Cook shoot a video for us. So please watch this video. Hi, my name is John Cook, and I'm an elder here at Real Life uh, Church. And this is my wife, Charity, and we're going to be kind of just sharing our story about our marriage and, and as we talk about the biblical roles in marriage, how that's kind of played out um, in, our, in our relationship. So Charity's going to start, and then I'm going to finish it up. John told me I had to submit and let him start, so that's why we let him go. No, um, I grew up in a very um, conservative Christian home. My dad was most definitely the leader in our home, and so that was my mindset from a young age that um, God had intended men to lead through marriage and through home life. Um, but if you have met me for longer than five minutes, you know that I um, have a very strong personality and have an opinion about just about everything. Um, So it does not always come easily to me that idea of submission or giving in is sometimes how I feel about it, even though that's not how God had intended it. Um, And so when I first met John, I had friends tell me that we should get together. I should date him. They really thought we'd make a good couple. And I said, There is no way I can ever date him. I would eat him for lunch. He is way too nice. And he still, to this day, that's one of the things I love about him is how kind he is and how nice he is. Um, And I just saw early on that our personalities have the potential to conflict in that way. Um, And as we started dating and I got to know him, I knew that this was for sure going to be something that I was going to have to work on. And my mom and I actually talked about it quite a bit and what it looks like to have a strong personality and yet submit to your husband. And when we went in for our first premarital counseling, I said to John in front of the counselor, "Um, if you don't lead this ship, I'll take over and lead it. So I really need you to focus on that. Um, And so that has been something that we've focused on a lot, I think, through our marriage in the fact that we are very different personalities. I am a decisive move ahead person perhaps before we're even ready to move ahead and John likes to think about everything for a really long time (laughs) and then make a decision but what I have learned from him over the years is that he makes an informed decision 
and he makes a decision with our family in mind and with me in mind and with our future in mind. And so I think what I have learned um, going through marriage with him is that I can trust him and I know when he's making a decision and I know when he has um, to tell me no on something that's a big deal to me or maybe even isn't a big deal but he just doesn't like to tell me no. Um, he does it because it's what's best for us. And the other big thing that I've had to work on is that sometimes he will indicate what he wants without actually saying it to me. And I can tell by the words he's used or even just suggestions that he's given which way he would like to go. And if I choose to listen, um, then I can follow his leading because sometimes he doesn't have a strong opinion on it, but I know I can pick up on his opinion just because I know him and um, I can kind of read through the lines with him. So I wouldn't say it's always been an easy road. Um, we, like every couple, have things that we do not agree on. Um, and I don't have not always willingly submitted to things. But the longer we go, the more I just know that he is someone that can be trusted. And so because of that, um, I am able to go with the plan that he has and know that he has thought it through. Yeah, I think when, you know, what Sherry shared is, is very true because I I don't always have strong opinions. And my, my default mode is sometimes to, you know, to not lead, you know, and, and Charity has had to do a, a really good job of, of, of kind of letting me take my time. But in knowing that she will, you know, let me take my time, let me think through things, um, let me kind of work it on my own time, but also know that because, because she is, is also a decisive person. If I don't make a decision, then it, it will kind of throw off that balance and it will kind of change. It, it kind of helps make me realize that I do need to make a decision about this. I, I've got all the information in front of me. Okay, you know, I, I'm ready to, to make a decision. And I think as my, you know, talking about her role of, of submitting, my role is to love her. And how do I show her that I love her so that she does feel like she can trust me, so that she does feel like she can submit and, 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 and listen to me. And, and some of the things that I've thought about that, that have kind of have played out in our marriage is, is number one, making decisions because many times I don't want to, and I'll kind of wait around and, and, and thinking that she will make one, but then, but then knowing that that's not my role, you know, as the leader of the, of the home and as the leader of the family, it's my job to make these decisions. I shouldn't put them on her. If it's, um, what to do with the kids, how to handle things, you know, at the house, um, kind of what direction is our family headed in and even sometimes small things. And I can see times where, where charity is asking for me to lead in my, my original kind of mode would be to say, whatever you want to do is fine, but that's not what she's wanting from me. She's not wanting just to do whatever she's wanting to know. What do, what do I want her to do? What do I want to do for our family? And so to pick up on those cues and to see those things and say, all right, Hey, I need to make a decision in this. Um, but how do I show her that, that I'm someone that she can trust by loving her? And, and I think, I do that by taking her into account when I'm making these decisions, when I'm looking at, at these things. Um, one thing I'll, I'll, I wanted to share that um, has come up in our in our marriage a lot is, 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 if you know my wife, you know that she loves horses. And if you know me, you'll know that I don't love horses. And, and there was a long time in our life that it was not the right time for us to have horses to go through that part. And I had to tell her no, and I said no, and I said no, and I said no. And then we finally got to a part in our life where Yes, we can do this. We can have this. And if I'd had my way, if I'd only wanted it to be about what I wanted and what I thought was best, we would still not have horses. And we have three. So, um, but I wanted to show her that I love her and that I value her interests and her opinions and what matters to her. And so I said, yes, we can do this now. This is at a spot where we can make this work and we can make it work again and again <laughs> and potentially a fourth time. Um, so... So I think I have to also be a husband who shows her that I love her and that I care about her so that she does feel like she can submit and she can trust me in those decisions. So, so that is kind of the, the journey that we have walked through in, in these roles of submission and love in, in marriage.
Awesome. Hi, my name is John Cook, and I'm an elder here at Real Life. <laughs> All right, then. Watch it again. Yeah. That means we don't have to say much. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's funny, when, when you hear that word submission, you can almost feel the tension go up in the room, right? Because submission, that idea, has, has got a bad taste in many people's mouths because it hasn't been done well. So hopefully, as we, as we go through God's Word today, we're going to see not only is it God's plan for us in this, this area of submission and being subject, but it's actually God's good plan for us. So I, I put in your top of your sermon notes a... Because we're going to talk about God's design for marriage, we have uh, the roles in marriage. We have to actually go back to the beginning of creation to see where God's design for this starts. And at the top of your sermon notes, I put a, a doctrinal statement from Renew.org in there because I think they just lay out the, the theological statement of men and women in marriage and how God's created them in our roles just so well. So here's what it says. We believe both men and women were created by God to equally reflect, in gendered ways, the nature and character of God in the world. In marriage, husbands and wives are to submit to one another, yet there are gender-specific expressions. Husbands model themselves in relationship with their wives after Jesus' sacrificial love for the church, and wives model themselves in relationship with their husbands after the church's willingness to follow Jesus. In the church... Men and women serve as partners in the use of their gifts in ministry while seeking to uphold New Testament norms, which teach that the lead teacher-preacher role in the gathered church and the elder overseer role are for qualified men. The vision of the Bible is an equal partnership of men and women in creation, in marriage, in salvation, in the gifts of the Spirit, and in the ministries of the church but exercised in ways that honor gender as described in the Bible. Yeah, I, I just think they say that very, very well. So, so for us to, as we enter this conversation about roles of men and women, let's go back to Genesis chapter 1 and see how God set it up in creation. In Genesis 1, 26, uh, it says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So even at creation, we see that there's equal value in men and women, and they're created by God to reflect his glory, to reflect his image, right? So if you've got it in your mind that somehow one, um, one of the sexes is less than the other, you've got it wrong. Because that's not how God set things up. But if we look here in Genesis 2.18, a little further down the page, it says, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So we've got this idea. I, I, I want to introduce you to a word. It's called primogen, primogeniture. Primogeniture. And the idea is it's the theological idea of the firstborn or the first created. So in Scripture, we see that um, we know that God has existed eternally. That'll matter here in just a moment. And then the man was created before the woman. We see that while they have equal value, they have different roles. It says here that the woman, uh, Eve, the first woman, was created to be the man's helper, right? So, so there, now, now here's the challenge for us today in 2022. When we start talking about equality, I've got a statement I want to read to you. It says, in America... Equality for men and women means sameness, means sameness. Marriage is disposable and in decline. Don't be surprised that the Bible's teaching on a created order between men and women seems outdated, odd, irrelevant, or worse. Defining sex and gender for ourselves, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> has become one of our culture's idols. And the Bible contradicts the steady stream of teaching from TV, movies, magazines, and social media. See, the conversation we're having this morning, 20 years ago in church, everyone would be like, why are we even having this conversation? We all agree that, that men and women are not the same, right? They're equal, but they're not the same. And I'm super glad we're not the same. I probably wouldn't like her as much if we were, okay? But as culture has shifted, 
in the, in the name of relevance, we want to shift with culture because we want everyone to feel comfortable. But the reality of God's word is that we're supposed to look different than culture, right? So as we look at Genesis 2.20, it says, The man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, all the wild animals. And for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord cre- uh, caused the man to fall into deep sleep, deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord man, uh, made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. This is why, that is why a man leaves his father and mother, is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Last week, we talked about that, that original design for marriage, right? We talked about that intimacy. They were naked before one another, which not only physically naked, but there was a vulnerability there, right, an openness there. They had not hurt each other. They had no secrets, and, and, and there was no shame, Right? They were like, this is how God made us, and it's good. Yeah, I can't even imagine really what it's going to be like one day to have that 100% trust. Yeah. Like confidence and trust. In it. Yeah. So one of the things that God does over and over in Scripture is he starts with creation, and then that creation carries into the church, right? So in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul starts a passage in 1 Corinthians 11, 12, 13, and 14, where he's talking about how worship's to be practiced in the church. He talks about leadership roles. He talks about spiritual gifts. In 1 Corinthians 11.3, he starts out by saying, But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Okay, so, so a couple things. First of all, we need to realize that Jesus Christ is the chief elder and senior pastor of this church that he has an authority over every one of us, right? We don't get to come up with our own truths. Jesus has already established them, and we submit to him, okay, every one of us. But I also want you to see this word that he says is called head, right? It says, uh, I want you to realize that uh, he says that the head of every man is Christ, the head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. In your sermon notes, uh, I think, yeah, in your sermon notes, I've got, uh, it, it's, it's, quite a ways down on your page. I've got a definition of that word head. And the Greek word is kephale. And it means head, authority, servant leader who follows Christ's example, a shepherd who cares for his sheep. There's a, a, a sense of vulnerability and trust in the headship of Christ who gave himself up for the church. He was fierce when fighting the enemy and gentle when tending the flock. And so as we start talking about this idea of headship, I want the men in the room to start thinking about this. There's a, there, there is a sense of authority there. There's also a sense of responsibility there, right? As Christ is the head of, of, of every man in the church, as the Christ is the, the head of the church, right? That's why we talk about the fact that we've talked about it in every, I think every sermon in God's design in this series we've been through, that without Actively abiding in Christ, man, you're toast. Without actively abiding in Christ, your marriages are not going to make it. You're not going to make it. Every relationship that you have will be just just a train wreck because you'll be in it on your own, right? Trying to work it out in your flesh with all your insecurities and all your fears and all your hurts, right? And the other thing I want you to see, men, is that if you're married, you are ahead, the question becomes, are you a good one or a bad one? Right? So as we go through this idea of headship, you know, it, it carries over into the church. That's why we have male elders here. Because it's one of those things God established as you follow the, uh, God, God's creative order. It says 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, here's a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer or elder is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. And he must do so in a manner full of, worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he, must, or, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. So that's why we have male elders here because we believe both Theron and Titus, God um, 
uh, assigns male eldership to the church. Um, we have women leaders in our church. My wife is one of the best leaders that I know, but she operates not only under the headship of the eldership in our church, but also, uh, also under the headship of, of me as her husband, right? And my boss, <laughs> yeah, yeah. since I'm the janitor around here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and here's, here's the deal. It, it, it operates like I'm one of the elders here. I'm the, the lead pastor of our church, but I, but I also submit to the authority of the eldership that God's put over me, right? So that's, what, that's the way this works, right? Um, in Titus chapter 2, we see it carry on into the, the relationships in the church, that we all have a role to play in this. It says, um, so Paul's writing to Titus, who's a church planner, if you will. He's a young guy. And, and so he's, he's telling him uh, to, to, to be who God's called him to be, to, to submit to the Lord by fulfilling the position that God's given him. And he says this, he says, You, mu however, must teach what's appropriate to sound doctrine. Now he's going to give us a picture of what sound doctrine looks like. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled and sound in faith, in love and endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what's good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and respect, uh, love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. And everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. This is why we're talking about these issues in the church. Because we're told by God that this is where the, this stuff gets worked out. This is where the relationships get practiced. This is where the marriages are supposed to be strengthened. Right? We're not going to hear it by Dr. Phil. We're not going to hear it by Oprah. We're not going to hear it, 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 it hanging out with your friends that are ungodly, that aren't following Jesus, that don't know how to die to themselves. You're going to hear all the other things. And so as we practice it here, this is where it starts. In our relationships with one another in home groups, in our relationships in men's groups, in our relationships in women's groups, this is why we encourage you to be in these relationships because if people don't know you, if people don't see your relationships, how are they going to be able to speak into those things? Right? How are you going to be able to build relationships where you trust someone enough where you're willing to listen to what they have to say to you? Right? This is why the, this is why the, I think this is one of the big issues of the church. In America, is we've created this thing where we have a relationship with the pastor, right? Like, because he yells at me every week, so we, we're good, right? But, 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 but we have, but, but we're not, we're, we're not being discipled. We're not learning how to do this stuff, right? In marriage, it continues. So this, this design that God has established in creation, this design God established in the church, it continues in marriage. In Ephesians 5.21, here's what Paul writes. <clears throat> Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Okay, submit to one another, not so, not so your spouse likes you, right? Or, or, oh, man, that's a whole other thing. But we do it as worship to Jesus because he has authority. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife. There's that word. The head of the wife is Christ is the head of his church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Fellas, how does Christ love the church? Sacrificially, tirelessly. It wasn't about him and, 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 and what he wanted. It was about the Father's will, submitting to the Father's will to play that role. Right, John, I love what John said, that sometimes I don't have a strong opinion, and sometimes it's easier to just say whatever you want. But as we submit to the Christ, what we do is we submit to the role that God gives us. Right? It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or blemish, but holy and blameless. 
In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. You know, one of the things Christy wrote in, our, in her letter to me. Well, what's he going to say? Uh, and this, this was, this was kind of hard for, for me to read. Is she talked about um, how she wanted us to grow spiritually. That she didn't feel like I was shepherding his, her as well as maybe I was shepherding the church. That's really good. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, I read it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you understood it. That's, yeah. that's, that's the big deal right yeah. there. Yeah. So, 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 so today we're on day two of Francis Chan's 30-day marriage devotional on, on, on mar- marriage devotional on marriage. Um, and, and so I, I want to tell you guys, you know, we operate on a little different timelines sometimes from each other. Um, so on you version, you can do, uh, you can do um, devotions together, like with a friend. And so you can both read it, and there's a place you can make notes together. So in the Chan one, what we're doing is we're making notes every day so the other one can read what we processed. And then there's videos that they do. And so our commitment was we'll do the devotions together, read what each other wrote, and then watch the videos together. So, so today we've got a video that we're going to watch together af- after church. So that's one of those ways that, that we're doing that. That's my idea of foreplay. <laughs> Just so you know. Parents, you're welcome. Just remember, it came from her, not me. Verse 31. Keeping it real, people. (laughs) Verse 31. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound (laughs) mystery. But I am, (laughs) amen. But I am talking about Christ in the church. However, each one of you must, look at this word. Each one of you, men, must love his wife. That that word must is strong, as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. And I think I'm going to pass it on to you. Okie dokie. You ready for this? (laughs) I don't know if I am. So last week, I shared with you guys that uh, 22 years ago, we were separated. Our marriage blew up. And I wanted to divorce. In fact, I was begging God for divorce. And God told me no. You will humble yourself before me and humble yourself before your husband. And when you do, I will bless you. And I said again, after the shock wore off, I had to make a decision whether I was going to obey Jesus, obey God, or follow my flesh. And so I knew enough to fear God. I knew enough about what disobedience to God looked like and felt like, and I didn't want that either. So I said, okay, fine. I can get humbling myself before you because you're a holy God. But I do not know how to humble myself before this man that I actually hate right now. And so I begged God, show me. Show me what that looks like. And I had women in my life that were speaking the word of God to me, the truth of God to me. I know, right? This woman who was uh, my disciple maker, she had been separated from her husband for 25 years She would not divorce him because she knew how much God hated divorce. And he was even living with another woman at the time. So she had really, I mean, biblically, she had a a reason and an excuse, but she just would not do it. And that was the woman that was speaking into my life. And I am so grateful for her that she was willing to just pray with me and walk with me and tell me God's truth. And so I decided at that point that I was going to just get out all my Bible stuff like the Strong's Concordance, all the dictionaries, and just start diving into what that word humble meant. And the Lord took me to that Titus 2 scripture. And so uh, I'm going to try and throw this together quickly in my brain, but let's go back really quick. Titus 2, uh, verse 5, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. When I read that, I looked that up. Um, What I did was just start going through and looking up every word that was humble. And the word that just kept coming up over and over and over again was this word submit, which in the Greek means hupotasso. And I love that um, 
even in this version that it started out as subject to their husbands. And then later on we read about the word submit in Ephesians like Jean just did. But the idea that came behind that was that if I don't do that, if I do not subject myself or submit myself, then I am blaspheming. That's really the word there that says malign. It's blasphemy. And God does not take that lightly. And so that was my bonk up alongside the head, my little swat on the fanny and park my rear end on the bench and to really bow before God in this. And so I looked up the word humble just in the regular random dictionary because I thought, okay, let's just see what what do we interpret um, humble as. And this is the definition that Random House has. Not proud or arrogant. Mm, Man, I was very proud and arrogant because I was so much more spiritual than he was. It's just disgusting, actually. (laughs) Having a feeling of insignificance or inferiority, subservience, there's that word again, low in rank, importance, size, etc., courteously respectful, which I was not at that time, to lower in condition, importance, or dignity, to abase, and then here it is, okay? And this is where I just got the gut punch. Head or gut? I got it in both places. To destroy the independence, power, or will of. I'm going to repeat that again. To destroy the independence, power, or will of. And so immediately the Holy Spirit just convicted me on this independent spirit that I had, this independent nature that I did not need him. And it was so counter to what God says. It's so counter to the way that it's supposed to be. And I grew up, I told you, in a single mom home, very strong-willed. I just knew I could do anything a man could do, probably better. And that was my, that's what we did. We just did that. And I was a firstborn, so there was a lot of expectations for me in that single mom home. And I just didn't need a man. I always thought that if I could have a guy who could um, bring me a paycheck, little nookie, be on the road again, we'd be good. <laughs> we did that. It didn't work. <laughs> so, so God is showing me this independence that I had. I really did need Jean. God really did design this to be and for me to come under that. The second part was um, uh, power. So women, we really can yield a lot of power over our men. Um, we're going to talk about how in one way next week, but we really do have a lot of power, and there's this darn thing called the curse that we got in the garden that we would want to lord over our men and boss them around. Am I the only one in here that wants to do that all the time, every second of the day? (laughs) So that was the other thing that God showed me. Girl, you are too bossy, and it is not about you and what you want, and so, all right, Lord, So that's the second place of conviction. And then the third place was will. And this is the one that got me. So I want to read Philippians because this is the scripture that God took me to on this will part. Therefore, if any of you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, and I feel like he's just saying, just a little spark, little tiny bit. Do you have any of that? Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of mine. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Okay, that was me. That, was just, that just spelled me. Selfish ambition, vain conceit, that was all over me and my independence. Rather in humility, value others above yourself. Dang, there's that word again. Not looking out to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. So, So the Lord is like, okay, Chrissy, don't look out for just your own interests. What about your husband? In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, Jesus is God. He did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He hoopa tassoed. 
by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And so when I read this, I was wrecked, you guys, on my face, and I just kept thinking, okay, Lord, Jesus, you were God, and you need nothing and no one, and yet you chose to become a man and come here for me, and here I am, all spiritually prideful. Okay, that's not okay. And then all of who you were, all your power as God, you laid aside to become a man and to be so humble, to love and to serve all those people. And you called me to that. And then in the garden, God, God sent Jesus to die for me. And he, he prayed three times, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. And so I had to choose again a path of obedience. Am I going to destroy this independent spirit that I have, my power to lord over my husband, and my own will? And every single day for the last 22 years, <laughs> that, that is what I face every second, every breath. How am I doing at that? And I have to just share this really quick. These are all my notes that I took when I was doing this study. So 20, these, these little papers right here are 22 years old, and I carry them with me all the time, and they're in my Bible all the time, and they'll fall out, and I'll just chuckle because that's just God reminding me because it's usually at the time I want to boss him around or do something that I shouldn't. <laughs> so, so I love that. So, so, and this is the other thing that I feel like. Every time you hear or read the word submit in the Scripture, think about that definition. What does that look like in every relationship, not just in your marriage relationship? That's good. Thank you. That's good. So in 1 Peter 3, Peter echoes what Paul talks about. Wives, in the same way, submit to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. And then a little bit longer, a little bit further down the page in 1 Peter 3, 7, I kind of want to camp out here as we finish up. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. Okay, that idea of being considerate is becoming a student of your wife. It is like actually knowing your wife. Right, there's this thing, right? I, I told you I loved you when I married you. If that changes, I'll let you know. Right? I, it's, like, it's like guys get the girl, and then they're like, man, now I'm going to go after the career. I'm going to go after the new dirt bike. I'm going to go after the truck. I'm going to make a name for myself. There's one, one person on the planet, if you're married, there's one person on the planet that God has called you to love more than any other person on the planet, and that's your wife. Right? We can't change that. That is the word of God. And so husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. I love that word considerate, right? Be a student. Treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your players. So, so, so men and women, men and women aren't the same. Women are weaker. Right? That's, that's not my opinion. That's God's word. That's how he built us. Man, and for me, for a lot of years, I hated the scripture. Yeah. I hated it and hated yeah. that word weaker. I can attest to that. <laughs> but, but even this, this idea of treating them with respect, right? I don't know how many times I have heard, you know, guys making jokes at their wife's expense. Guys browbeating their wives. Guys taking their rights over the, the rights of their wives. You know, respect my authority. That, that whole idea. Okay, if that's your opinion, man, g did you read what comes at the end of that passage? If you don't treat your wife with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. So there's an equality right there. God says that the warning here, the hammer he brings is do this so that nothing will hinder your prayers. I don't know about you, but I need God to hear my prayers, right? Some of you, like, and I've talked to some of you, it just feels like my, 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 my prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. Two questions that always come if you're a married man is, first of all, how's your relationship with Christ? And then second of all, how's your relationship with your wife? Because this 
affects this. And, and man, and, and I've heard the guys, this affects this. and this affects this, yeah. you're right. And, I, and I've heard it over and over again, the guys that victim themselves, right? Well, you don't know my wife. I don't, but I know your God. And I know the responsibility he puts on men. It is hard, but it is not too hard because you have the Holy Spirit. And that's the thing that I really want to encourage the women in this room. I know some of you have lived with very authoritative husbands. Get under my thumb. And I want you to know, like I said last week, that God knows your heart. He sees the brokenness there. He knows how he has designed it. So I want you to just continue to pray and trust God. Because I didn't trust him at first. Right. But I had to trust what God said. Stay, and then I'll bless you. Yeah. And and, and just so you know, she, she didn't, like, hate me for a while. Just She didn't wake up one day thinking, oh, I hate him. I gave her every reason. There were women, so the women, I, 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 I'm just gonna, I know we got to be done, but i got to tell you this. The woman that she, that was discipling her, they used to walk around our neighborhood praying for me. And I hated that woman because I thought what she was doing was telling my wife that she needed to get a new husband like all the other friends that she had were telling her. But instead, she was telling my wife, what does God's word say? Right? Yeah. That's true discipleship then we're going to read the Word of God, and we're going to expect the actions from the Word of God. So I actually had to ask that lady to forgive me uh, years later. So what does it look like to treat our wives with respect as the weaker partner? Colossians 3.12, I think, just sums it up so well. Um, not only in our marriages, but as Christy said earlier, in every relationship that you have. So you may not be married, right? You, you might not be married, but, but you can still take this word and apply it to the relationships as your, your wife. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So, guys, we got, guys, we got, we got to put this on, right? Ladies, we got to put this on. We got to become compassionate, kind, humility, gentle, patient. If we just did that in our marriages, how, how transformational would that be? Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against some of someone. Some of you have, have, have been holding an ought against your spouse for something that happened, you know, 25 years ago. Man, you got to ask God, you got to forgive as you've been forgiven. Right? For, uh, That's what he says next. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and song from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And then th this last point just sums it all up. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So application points at the end. Everyone, okay, learn to submit to Christ. Learn to submit to the authority he's put over you. We're not good at that. We need God's help to learn how to submit to that authority. Husbands, learn to be servant leaders. That Saturday morning men's group, I hate getting up early on Saturday morning, after, especially after preaching Friday night. But I need to sit with other men. And I need to learn how to love my wife the way Christ um, has called me to love her and to learn how to lead. And I need guys, like, looking in my eyes and praying for me when I mess it up. And they need that from me also. Okay, wives, learn to submit to your husbands. It's not natural, right? It's, it goes contrary to our flesh. It's hard, but it's not too hard, right? Shall we pray for them and be done? Thank you. Father God, thank you. Thank you for being good. Thank you for being good to us. Thank you, Jesus, for the forgiveness of sin that we enjoy. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. Father God, I know that there are things that we've talked about this morning that, that are hard, things that, that cut deep. That's what your word does, is it cuts deep. But God, I, I believe it cuts deep so we can be healed and be made whole. So, God, I pray that you would guide us. I pray that you would um, uh, guide us in our, in our marriages and our relationships. We pray 
Jesus, that you would empower us to be who you say we are. And Lord, I just, I look forward to the good news and the good works we're going to hear that are accomplished because you're working in our lives and our marriages. We love you, Lord. Thanks for being so good to us. We pray all of this in Jesus' holy, perfect name. Amen. Pastor Kev's going to come up and lead us through communion. Love you, church. So we're going to continue our service with communion. Um, so the servers, they're going to get the elements ready. Uh, they're going to pass them out and uh, just hold on to those, those elements. And just to, to let you know here at Real Life, we look at you as family. So if you are a follower of Jesus, uh, this communion is for you. You don't have to be a member or anything like that. Um, if you haven't accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, you can let that pass by, and that's okay. There's, there's no judgment in that. Um, but maybe this could be an opportunity to where you can say yes to Jesus for the first time in your life. If you do that, come let me know, okay? <laughs> All right. So the servers are going to pass those out. There's two cups. Um, inside one is, is a small cracker, and then there's juice in another. So just hold on to those, and we're going to take them together here in a few moments. Uh, but earlier, Gene led us through some directed prayer. Um, scripture in 1 Corinthians is, is really clear about um, taking communion in a worthy manner. And we do that through, the Word tells us, through self-examination, through directed prayer. And I just want to encourage you as, as you're getting that communion, as you're holding on to it, just a few things. Maybe during this time, um, during this message that Gene and Christy shared with us, God just spoke to you. Maybe he revealed something in your life that, uh, that is just not what he wants for you. It's not what's best. It's a sin. Maybe you need to just confess that to him right now. Maybe you just need to spend a few moments to just thank Jesus. You know, I, I want to share Romans 5, 8 with you, and this is, for me, um, a perfect way that God demonstrated his love for you and I, the sacrificial love. Thank you. And Romans 5, 8 tells us that we, while we, while you and I were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that, that love that the word calls us to as husbands and wives to, to have that sacrificial love is just, it's the ultimate call, but Jesus gave us that perfect example. So I got one. Thank you. And so with communion, this is a time where we're just reminded of what Jesus has done for us. That empty tomb, we get to celebrate that together as a family. It's a reminder of the new covenant in Jesus' blood. It's a reminder, and Romans 8.1 tells us that there's nothing that can separate you and I from God's love. Nothing at all. He knows it all. He says it's finished. It's done with. It's covered. And so I just want you to know that this morning. That's a truth that you can take to heart, that Jesus knows you. He knows you better than your spouse. And guess what? He loves you unconditionally. So know that this morning. So let's just take a moment, go into the throne room, and uh, just talk with Jesus here. I'm going to read to you out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This is the, uh, the Apostle Paul speaking to us. This is the Lord's Supper. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's take that together. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So let's take it together. And for, 
For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, thank you for your love for us, God. Thank you, Lord, that, as Chrissy said so well, you humbled yourself to death on a cross, a criminal's death, God. And you did that for all of us, God, for everyone that calls on your name for salvation, Lord. That invitation is open for anyone, Lord. We, we aren't called to, to clean ourselves up first, Lord. God, you said you came for, for the unrighteous, Lord, and that's all of us. And that invitation, Lord, I pray, is received by anyone um, that hears your good news of the gospel. Um, I pray for those this morning. Maybe there's someone in this room, God, that hasn't called out to you yet as Lord and Savior. And so I just, I pray for that person, Lord, maybe it's someone online, that they would, they would say yes to you, God, as Lord and Savior. They would know that um, they are loved by a holy, perfect God and that they can trust you. And God, you call us out of our old life of, of sin and death and into a new life with you, Lord, of everlasting life with you, God, in heaven. And I, I pray, God, for relationships this morning as we focused on marriage, your design for marriage, God. I pray husbands would, would step up and lead. God, they would do that as a servant leader. They would have a servant's heart. God, I pray for the wives, Lord, with um, their equal and unique role in marriage, um, that they would, they would step into that, God, with all humility. And God, um, thank you for just the relationships you put us all in. I know, God, there's, there's many here this morning that aren't married, and this message, God, applies to them, Lord. How, how can they live out your, your way, your design for relationships, God, with, with others, with friends, with family, with coworkers? Um, I'm just reminded, Lord, that your way is best even when in our own minds, in my mind, I think I have a better way. God, culture tells us one thing and your word tells us another. And I pray that every day we can trust your word and know that it's true and live that out and that we would be different. And that difference, God, is uh, we're your people. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the offering that was given. I pray that you would uh, bless it, multiply it. And I'm just so thankful, God, for this church family. I uh, pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, there's going to be a few of us up front. If you would like any prayer, you can always fill out those orange or blue cards for prayer requests as well. Thank you, Kevin. We invite you to stand for our closing song. Surgeon, my soul needs a 
a couple things. Um, first of all, thank you. Thank you for letting us be honest about our stuff here at church and being a church that's willing to do that. You know, um, you, you have no idea what a blessing that is where we can just journey together and be okay with the fact that none of us are perfect, but God is and he's calling us to something better. So thanks for being that church. Secondly, those of you that took part in the in the, the date nights, thanks for investing in your marriage. Right? Thanks for leaving your kids with us. I know that's a big deal. Um, the good news is we didn't lose any, right? Um, so I'm just grateful for that, that, that you did that. I think we're going to try to do that again next year um, because I think it's a good thing. And then thirdly, when Kevin talked about, um, I, I heard in the room when he talked about Cornerstone cheating last year, it's because Cody Karst literally cheated with his chili. So, um, and he admitted that, okay? Um, I may be a sore loser. Um, but church, we love you. God bless you. Have a great day. And we're just praying for you. We just want you to know we're, we're praying for you. So God bless you.